Mark is a PhD student at Stanford University uh, in the math department. And here he will give us a summary of the recent paper that resolves that conjecture. Hopefully, he will give us a quick introduction to what that conjecture is. Uh, welcome, Mark. We are excited to hear about your work. Take it away. OK, uh, great. Thanks, everyone, so much for coming. Uh, so today, I'll tell you about a universal law of robustness via isoparametry. And um, as was just mentioned, it's uh, joint with Sebastian Bubeck. So the, the motivation uh, for this, of course, comes from adversarial examples. And um, the kind of basic point of view is that we know two things. We know that neural networks uh, in practice, essentially memorize the training set so they have zero training error. And they are vulnerable to small adversarial perturbations. So what's going on? Um, one way or another, it seems like we're having difficulty training a robust memorizer. So why is this? So here are some uh, plausible high-level explanations for why it might be tough to train a robust memorizer. It might be that there's some computational difficulty in uh, finding one out of you know, the big haystack of all possible uh, functions we could use to predict stuff. It could be that neural networks are not very well suited to memorizing robustly. It could be that we need more training data. Or maybe it could be that we need larger models, or maybe several totally different explanations. So what I'll tell you about today, the law of robustness is a theorem now, which suggests that uh, this last explanation, that we need bigger models, is at least part of the picture explaining what's going on. OK. So um, I'm going to get to sort of a theorem. So I need to lay out the model for what I'm talking about. So what do I have in mind when I say that we're going to be memorizing? So what we'll do is we'll take our inputs to be uniform on a d-dimensional unit sphere, and we'll have n of them, where n is some polynomially sized uh, value in the dimension. And uh, the, the exact um, distribution for uniform on the sphere is not so important, as I'll say more about later. But uh, certainly, it's a good thing to have um, in mind. Uh, for our labels, we'll consider a pretty general model where we have some kind of deterministic signal function plus some noise. So we want there to be some non-trivial noise, but it can be just noise or it can be kind of weak noise where there's mostly signal or uh, kind of anything in between there. Um, what does memorization mean? Certainly, if we have a function that perfectly fits all the data points, then it perfectly memorized. Um, we'll also uh, be happy considering partial memorization, where we have a function that just fits the data better than the signal. So as long as you're memorizing at least a good chunk of the noise, uh, we're considering you to be a memorizer. So we also care about robustness. Mark, and... a quick question on, on the last bit. You said... Yeah. Uh, uh, fitting the data much better than the signal, I guess, much better, much better than the corrupt, the corrupted signal, right? Uh, um, meaning that here your RMS is is less than the added noise. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So so this this one half is just some number less than one. Like, could make it 0.9 or whatever. But um, you know, if, if you took f to just be this function g, then then you would have equality, and the 1 half would be replaced with a 1, right? So just, I want something less than 1 there. So why should this be less than 1? I'm a little bit confused. Yeah, so um, I guess the the idea here is that, you know, I, we need some reasonable model for memorization if we're going to think about this. And if, if, the, if the labels are just deterministic, then, um, from the angle we're coming at this with, it just doesn't make any sense because there's there's nothing to really learn. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
So uh, I think from a, maybe if you're trying to map this onto something realistic, uh, what we hope makes sense is that the, the signal is kind of the simple part of the function and the, the noise is kind of the hard to learn part of the function, mm -hmm. um, something like that. So yeah. did, did you say that the, the target here uh, in the bottom is that you get the mean square error that is less than one? That's the part that I didn't quite get. So, um, so let's say that we just take f to be this function g, which I'm calling this signal. So then by definition, the left-hand side will just be the sum of the zi squared. That's like the total noise level. So um, if that's happening, then we're not memorizing this noisy part at all. I see. But, but if, we, if we get a better error than that, then we do have to at least partially learn this noise stuff. That's what's going on here. OK, now I finally get it. Thank you. So it's it's basically having a train error smaller than the test, or smaller than the best test error you could get. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. So 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 if you really think the, if you're really treating the noise as random, that's true. If you're treating the noise as like, like an analogy for the the difficult to learn part of the function, that might not be true. Hi, Mark. So uh, a quick question. So the f here corresponds to the g plus z times signal. Or uh, what's the definition of f here? So so f is just some function that's attempting to memorize these labels yi, right? So so if perfect memorization exactly means that f equals g plus z. Okay. Is there a particular meaning for the x and the z here? Uh, uh, you mean for the G and the Z or? Oh, no, the covariate, the X and the Z. Is there any particular meaning? Um, so, so we don't have any like particular application being singled out here, if that's what you mean. I, I think we're, we're just thinking about kind of generic high dimensional data uh, as the input and that uh, one well, of okay, the most fine. generic and models is uniform ones. May become clear later, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, any, anything else? Uh, I think we're good. Uh, I, I want to, yeah, people who are encouraged to ask questions, you can use the hand raise button or type your question in the chat if you're shy. Uh, both are good and we'll manage them. Thank you. Go ahead, Mark. Okay. So, um, so somehow this is the model we're going to use. Um, the next thing we need to think about is uh, robustness. So we're going to say that the function f that we learn is robust if it has a small Lipschitz constant, meaning that if we change the input x to a close by input x prime, then the output that we predict is also not going to change very much. It's going to change by most a small multiple of the amount we change the input. So the idea here is that an adversarial perturbation is changing the input a little bit. And so if we have this, this uh, Lipschitz property that exactly says that any small change in the input will lead to a small change in the output, so we should be robust to adversarial input perturbations. Um, uh, of course, this is a rather, this is a little bit stronger because you might think that if your function is Lipschitz in most places, then um, that, that might still work. Um, but somehow this is a kind of very clean thing to think about uh, mathematically. And it's, it's at least as strong as being uh, adversarially robust. So kind of the gold standard for what we're going to be thinking about is perfect memorization with a robust function. And in the setting I described before where we have uniform points on a sphere, this is always true in the sense that you can always write down some function that does this. Uh, to see why, uh, a simple reason is that 
as long as you don't have an insane exponentially large number of points on your sphere, any two inputs x j will be pretty far from each other, at least a constant distance apart. And there's an abstract math theorem called the Kurtz-Brown extension theorem that says that if I want to um, kind of fit a basically arbitrary bounded function on these inputs and they're all far apart, then I can do so in a Lipschitz way. Um, so that's a little bit abstract. And so what if we want to actually construct a good memorizer? So what I want to focus on is constructing a memorizer within a function class. So typically when we're doing learning, we have some function class we have in mind and we're trying to fit within that class. So it's natural to ask how big a function class do we need to fix beforehand in order to have some robust memorizer, depending on the random input and output data, live inside that class? How big a model do we need? So, Mark, yeah. I, I have a question for you. Uh, it's just because I'm interested in like similar problems. So uh, what are the hypotheses for the, um, the, the fact that with high probability, the data points are far from each other? You need to be in a high dimensional space, I guess, and like you, you need some property on the distribution, the underlying distribution, I guess. Yeah. So I guess what I mentioned before was that they're uniform on the sphere. So uh, are you asking about a more general? Yeah, exactly, we... exactly, exactly. What would be like the most general condition? Um, I'm not sure. So, so I, I guess if you have like. Uh, some kind of bound on the density of your probability distribution. So, I mean, uniform on a sphere doesn't really have a density, but you know, if we replace it with a Gaussian, then it does. Mm -hmm. um, like, if you have a bound on your density at, at like on most of the probability space, then I guess that will tell you that each little ball has a small chance to contain multiple points. I so, see. so maybe something like that would be I a see. reasonable way to guarantee this abstractly. OK, thanks. Yeah. But so certainly, it's, it's kind of what you expect in high dimensions. Um, yeah. Um, any other questions about what's going on here? Cool. OK, so I mentioned that we what we want to do is see how large a function class we need to work in, which basically means how large a model uh, we need to train inside. So we're going to measure the size of a function class by the number of parameters, which I'll call p, that we need to use in order to pick out an individual function in this class. Um, more precisely, we can define this uh, in a pretty general way. Uh, we'll say that each function in our class is defined by a parameter vector consisting of p real values. And we will require that this parameter vector um, has some polynomial size bound, so it's not going off to infinity. And um, that as we vary the parameter vector, the function doesn't jump around like totally crazily. But uh, we can, we're happy with any kind of polynomial indeed dependencies here, so we're not, we're not worried about getting too fine-grained of a control here, just, just something reasonable where we have p parameters. Um, this is an abstract general definition, but it, it does apply kind of directly to neural networks, because if I have a neural network, it's described by all the weights and all the biases and so on. Um, and it kind of, uh, yeah, sorry, question? Oh yes, yeah, so, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I just have a question about the middle, the middle formula. Is it uniform in X? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Right. So, so this should be true for any X. So, for for any input value X, if I change the parameter a little bit, the the value X doesn't change like crazy. Okay. Great. So, so it's the same as saying that the the map from W to F W is continuous in the like uniform norm or something. Yeah. So, so this is kind of an abstract definition, but it, it does capture neural networks. And because it's kind of abstract, uh, it even gives you the correct parameter count 
if you're thinking about convolutional layers and shared weights and stuff, because uh, I can just I can just write down a single coordinate from my W into many different places in the neural network. Um, so it kind of, you know, we don't have to think so much about different architectures uh, when we're counting parameters. It, it just kind of makes sense. Um, I do want to point out that P is the number of parameters in the model class. So if if I train something like a sparse weight matrix, then a lot of the values will be zero. So you know, if I have a million possible parameters that might potentially be non-zero, but only a thousand of them uh, are non-zero, then the value of p is still the larger value of a million. Um, so that's one way to try to circumvent this. OK. So if we look at how many parameters we need to learn these generic uh, inputs and outputs, uh, it seems like there's kind of a trade-off where we need larger models to get robustness. So if we just care about memorizing without any robustness, we only actually need n parameters. And in fact, as Eric Baum showed in 1988, and I think Sebastian showed maybe in some more detail when he was presenting, it actually suffices to use a two-layer neural network here with n over d neurons. It's a non-robust construction, but it it fits the data perfectly. And some intuition here is that we're kind of just solving n equations when we fit n data points. So it makes sense that we only need about n parameters. Uh, yeah, question? Excuse me, the fact number one, this is true for what, what you mean the fact is this true for perfect memorization, right? Like uh, you yeah, also learn yeah. the signals too, right? And noise, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So just just any inputs and outputs, okay. basically. You you just need some kind of. Uh, you don't need this stuff about the sphere at all. You just need some general position thing that says like mm -hmm. the points aren't all in the same line or the same plane or something. Very okay. Strange. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and also when when I say n parameters, I, I guess I actually mean like four n or something. I'm, OK, but so if we don't care about robustness and we just want to memorize, we can get away with only using n parameters. But if we want to robustly memorize, this construction doesn't work. On the other hand, there is a nice simple construction that uses n times d parameters, uh, where we just, again, take advantage of the fact that these input points are separated. We can kind of do a constructive version of this Kirsch-Brown theorem where we put like a radial basis function on each of the points. And each of these radial basis functions will just give that point any value we want and won't affect uh, the other inputs. And each radial basis function needs d parameters to tell you where it actually is. And so this is n d parameters in total. Um, does this make sense? Cool. OK. So what the law of robustness says is that this trade-off is real. It's not just that we couldn't find any better constructions for robust memorization. And in fact, if we want to use a p-parameter function class, then we're going to need a Lipschitz constant of at least square root of n times d over p. So if we want to have a a Lipschitz constant that's constant, it's not growing with the dimension, then we really need p to be nd. And if we have um, p is only n, so there's no overparameterization, then we, we need a Lipschitz constant that's at least square root d. So uh, in Sebastian's talk a couple of months ago, he talked about this as a conjecture for two-layer neural networks. And uh, what we can show now is that it's true in a lot more generality in basically the generality of these abstract function classes that I laid out before, as long as there's some noise in the data. Um, moreover, we don't need the input distribution to be this nice perfect spherical thing. It can be a mixture of almost n different distributions, as long as these individual distributions have an isoparametric property that I'll say more about in the next slide. So uh, you can have a mixture of 
n to the 0.99 spheres or Gaussians or other things that kind of feel like that. Um, I should point out that we are assuming our parameters are bounded by something like polynomial in the dimension. Uh, so we technically do not fully resolve the conjecture because uh, you could imagine a two-layer neural network where you have parameters that are very large, but somehow the, the different uh, functions cancel out in some crazy way. Um, this bound of square root nd over p is also actually tight for basically any value of p, because in general, you can project down to a random subspace of lower dimension and use this radial basis function construction that I talked about before. And this will give you an equality construction um, achieving root nd over p in general. OK, so what is this isoparametry property? So basically, I, I want to say that this is kind of a very ubiquitous theme of high dimensional space. Um, it's, it's related to log Sobolev inequalities and these sorts of things. Um, but the, the precise definition is that if I have any Lipschitz function um, and I look at the values of this Lipschitz function f uh, on an input drawn from my distribution mu, then this uh, value of f has some sub-Gaussian tails. And uh, there's a d in the exponent uh, over here. So this, uh, this uh, tail decay is supposed to be um, more and more extreme as I go into higher dimensions. That's, that's uh, essentially a consequence of the scaling. So um, often you see inequalities like this without any d in the exponent, but that's because you have a sphere of square root d radius. And uh, I'm thinking about a sphere of unit radius, so, so things get scaled somehow. So this applies to a lot of distributions, like spheres or Gaussians, or cubes with a Hamming distance and L1 distance. Uh, also various other examples, like um, manifolds with a certain type of curvature condition, or Gaussians plus a, a little bit of small extra noise being added that doesn't have to be Gaussian, uh, and things like this. So how can we try to interpret this? So I would argue that real data sets uh, are mixtures. This is a reasonable way to think about them. We're trying to, if we're trying to tell between a cat and a dog, certainly there's at least a cat component and a dog component. Um, perhaps a little more fine grained there's a component where there's one cat, there's a two cat component, there's a red cat, there's a blue cat, there's a, there's a cat and a dog in different parts of the picture. I don't know, but presumably there are much less than n components for any endpoint data set. Um, another more, more interesting issue is that probably the components don't exactly look like spheres or Gaussians or anything super nice. But I think plausibly, uh, we could think that they live on some kind of lower dimensional manifold and they, they behave sort of like a spherical distribution in, in some lower dimension. And so we'd, what we'd like to hope is that the law of robustness will hold for an appropriate effective dimension, uh, even in practice. And if we're trying to uh, get some real predictions here, we can try to determine empirically what kinds of naive versus uh, true dimension scalings uh, occur and extrapolate from you know, small data sets to large data sets and so on. Um, something else that uh, was asked about previously is noise. So in theory, we, we need some noise for this formulation to make any sense. Uh, we're thinking about the model size. And if there's no noise, then we just need one function in our function class, the, the true signal function. And in real life, what we like to claim is that the noise can be thought of as the complicated part of the function. So let me try to say something about uh, how we would run through one of these extrapolations that I suggested uh, in the case of MNIST and ImageNet. 
So this will be a very speculative calculation. Um, you might have different ideas about how some of the details could be done, um, but I'll go through it as sort of an example for how uh, I think this uh, theoretical result could lead to predictions and, and uh, that sort of thing. So I'm going to be taking the MNIST results from this paper of uh, Madri and some of his students. And in MNIST, we have something like 10 to the fifth data points. And the number of pixels is something like 1,000. Moreover, they achieved good robust accuracy at something like a million parameters. So if we think about what the effective dimension is here by just matching it with the law of robustness to say it, that it should be p over n, where p is the million parameters needed for robust accuracy, then we get that the effective dimension seems like 10, which is the naive dimension divided by about 100. So what I'll do is I'll treat this 100 as a proportionality constant and just scale up to ImageNet. And when I do this, uh, as you can see here, I get the uh, rather bold and speculative prediction that ImageNet should need something like 10 to the 10 parameters. And you know there, there are many ways you could try to quibble with this. Maybe you think that instead of d over 100, it should be d to some power. Um, maybe you think that ImageNet pictures are more complicated, so we should raise the number of parameters a little bit. Um, but this is somewhat more than uh, most current models are using, which is uh, an order of magnitude or so smaller. So what the result suggests, if we plug it in this way, is that uh, if we want to succeed at robust ImageNet, we should try making bigger models. Let me say something now Matthew, about the... Uh, Matthew, sorry. I have a question for you uh, on the previous slide. Yeah, so sure. if you take the current models that are like uh, 10 to the 9, uh, that have 10 to the 9 parameters, and you train on a reduced ImageNet, that has like, I, I would say, uh, 10 to the 5 uh, examples. So if you take n for ImageNet, that is 10 to the 5. So what your conjecture is, uh, speculative conjecture is saying is that uh, we should be able to get a robust model by training on a smaller data set. Um, yeah, yeah. That, that That's something it suggests, yeah. Which, which is probably easier to uh, try and practice than uh, scaling up uh, models by uh, a thousand parameters. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. That sounds right. Okay. I can try this at home then. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> great. Yeah, it would be great if uh, it would be great if you did that. Uh, I, I, I'm coming at this from math side, so I, I don't know how to do that, but that would be awesome. I mean, I mean, just uh, reducing the data set size is just getting the GitHub folder of some uh, ImageNet uh, robust classifier and divided the data set size by a thousand. Uh, but yeah, it's. I agree. You need like uh, <laughs> it's easy on on paper, and then uh, scaling it up on the cluster may be painful. Okay. Thanks. So, uh, let me say something about how the proof goes in a simplified case where we're just thinking about perfect memorization and uh, we just have pure noise, so there's no signal, we just have IID plus minus one labels. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to assume that the labels are somewhat balanced. So we have N labels, each one is either plus one or minus one, and it's 50-50. So with very high probability, at least a third of the labels are plus, and at least a third of the labels are minus one. Um, this isoparametric property tells us that for any fixed function little f in my function class, um, it's either one on a exponentially small e to the minus d amount of the sphere, or it's negative one on an exponentially small amount of the sphere. Um, so this is essentially uh, equivalent to what isoparametry says. It says that I can't be one and minus one both on pretty big sets. One of these sets has to be like e to the minus d small. So 
if I take this um, fixed function f and I ask for the chance that at least a third of the input points that are drawn randomly from the sphere get the unlikely label, then the probability will get taken to the roughly nth power because I need roughly n points to have this unlikely label. And so my e to the minus d goes to an e to the minus nd. Um, now, there are uh, a lot of different choices of n over 3 points out of n points. And so if you remember how this stuff works, I should be multiplying by something like n choose n over 3. But that's only exponentially large in n. And so e to the minus nd is still going to completely dominate that term. Uh, Mark, can you, before you proceed, um, I did not understand this isoperimetry uh, property. So you're saying that for each function in your function class, uh, that inequality holds. And yeah. then what we have in that minimization, um, you're basically taking that fixed function f and you're saying that what the, the fixed function f should with, oh boy, with uh, decaying probability, no. Should, should should assign very little mass to to all ones or all minus ones is that what it is yeah yeah exactly yeah so let me let me uh, say that again so um, so if I take a fixed function f in my class and I um, I don't think about the data set x1 through xn at all I just have this function and I have my my state space which is the sphere mm -hmm. then I so perimetry basically says that Either my function f has a very small amount of the sphere where it's 1, or it has a very small amount of the sphere where it's minus 1. So you know I can make a function that's 1 on half the sphere and minus 1 on half the sphere uh, by having it be discontinuous. I can just take the sign of the first coordinate. Mm -hmm. um, if I you know make it continuous just on a little thin strip in between there where there where the first coordinate is almost zero, I can make it be one on like 49% of the sphere and negative one on 49% of the sphere. But what isoperimetry says is that for this construction, the, the little uh, slice where it transitions from negative one to one needs to be super thin. So it has to have a large Lipschitz constant if I do that. I see. So, so the Lipschitz property tells me that I can't have a lot of ones and a lot of minus ones at the same time, because the, the transition between them needs to be kind of big. Interesting. OK, OK, I think I get it. Yeah. And, and to, be, to be clear, you know, if, I, if I give you my, my n data points x1 through xn beforehand, as long as they're separated, if I tell you that like these half should be one and these other half should be minus one, mm -hmm. um, I, I can make now a Lipschitz function that that fits these points. Um, this radial basis function construction will do that, and the Lipschitz constant won't blow up with the dimension. So, so this is really a fact about the whole sphere, not just like a large finite subset of the sphere. And here, mu is the measure on the on the sphere. Yeah, yeah. So here, mu is the isoparametric distribution. So just say the uniform distribution on the sphere, and x is being sampled from the probability measure mu. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. I get it. No, thanks. Yeah. So there's a minimum of two probabilities, the chance to be one, the chance to be minus one. I'm saying one of these is exponentially small in the dimension. This is, yeah. Basically equivalent isoperimetry. Uh, yeah. Another question. So I'm a bit confused. So this property only depends on mu. Like, I mean, on the, uh, the, how, when do we know that any quality would hold? So it holds when mu has this isoperimetry property. And that's all we need, right? And we need f to be, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, we need f to be Lipschitz. So, so I'm, I'm kind of, uh, um, maybe, maybe uh, sorry, think that uh, the function class like only consists of Lipschitz functions. Uh, it, I somehow didn't write this very well, but. Um, so, but but we don't know the Lipschitz, uh, and we will later show that that bound on the Lipschitz constant would be uh, like what you want to prove, right? But they are all Lipschitz. Is that right? Um, yeah. So maybe uh, maybe think of 
what I'm saying is uh, I have a function class f, and every function in it is Lipschitz. And I'll show that, it, you know, like constant Lipschitz constant, like, you know, one Lipschitz. And, and what I'll show is that f needs to be really big for this robust memorization to be possible within f. OK. Yeah. I got it now. Yeah, so, so what I said here, the, this, this function f is Lipschitz. And I, I didn't write that, and I should have. But the, this, little, this function little f is supposed to be a Lipschitz function here. OK, I get it. Cool. Yeah, thanks for the questions. So, so again, um, to recap, when f is Lipschitz, because of this isoperimetry property, at least one of the labels plus or minus 1 has to have a small probability exponentially small in the dimension. And then if we need f to um, output this unlikely label on a lot of the input points, that amplifies the probability to be even much smaller because uh, we need this exponentially rare thing to happen n over three times. So, so now the probability becomes e to the minus nd. So what we just showed is that each individual function is a perfect memorizer with probability less than e to the negative nd. And if we just union bound over all the functions in our function class, uh, which we're assuming to all be uh, Lipschitz, then uh, we need our function class to be exponentially large in n times d in order to memorize. Um, I made this assumption that the labels were balanced, so we have at least a third plus ones and a third minus ones. Um, but I only made this assumption once. Uh, I didn't make, I didn't have to make it like once for each function in my class. So, so this is fine. Um, and now the idea is just that if I have a p parameter function class, I can approximate it by a discretization that has size uh, exponential in p. I can just um, take a grid of uh, side length like a tenth or like 1 over d squared or, or kind of anything. And then uh, the size of the discretization will be like 1 over d squared or whatever to the pth power. So basically just exponential in p. Um, whatever little side length of my grid I use doesn't really matter. And, and so that's, that's uh, basically the proof in this uh, simplified case. So I, I stated the result in some more generality. If I want to think about partial memorization, um, I'm going to have a similar proof, but I'll think about the probability that a fixed function correlates well with the noise. So um, the proof will look a little bit more technical, but the underlying idea will be essentially the same. Uh, I also said that this result holds if I have a mixture of isoparametric distributions. And the idea here is I just need some version of this balanced labels assumption within each component. OK. Um, let me also say that we have a kind of generalization version of this result as well. So. If you recall kind of classically, there's this concept called the Rademacher complexity. And if a function class has small Rademacher complexity, then this implies uniform convergence types of guarantees over the entire function class. And classically, the result that you get from a turnoff type of bound is that a function class has Rademacher complexity at most log of its size over n all in a square root. And here, the log of the size is roughly the number of parameters. And what our law of robustness proof basically shows, if you translate it into this setting, is that we gain a factor of d in the denominator for this uh, type of Rademacher complexity guarantee. A nice uh, consequence of this is that the law of robustness that I stated holds, even when I'm not thinking about the squared loss, but uh, any reasonable uh, Lipschitz loss function. Um, so this is my uh, last slide. I'll just mention some open directions. Uh, everything I said was for the um, Euclidean norm. There are lots of other norms. There's L infinity, which 
as I understand, is more um, commonly used when thinking about adversarial robustness. Uh, there are also other things that aren't really LP norms that people use as perturbations. So it would be great to get some better understanding of what happens in these situations. Um, the law of robustness, as I stated it, kind of um, doesn't exactly capture the robust test accuracy. It captures it just the Lipschitz constant, which is kind of an upper bound. And, and we require the Lipschitz constant to be large every, or to be bounded everywhere. So, so um, there are standard Sobolev norms that let me express that a function has small gradient almost everywhere, but uh, those don't really work at all, actually. We need a small gradient everywhere for this kind of statement to be true. But maybe there's another version that uh, gets around this somehow. Um, I would love to see some empirical study of this. Um, and to see if these kinds of scaling laws that one can predict uh, hold true, uh, maybe for a variety of different architectures and types of data sets and, and these sorts of things. Um, so thanks very much, and uh, keep asking <laughs> questions. Uh, let's thank our speaker.